Hey folks, Curtis Stone here. It's been about a year since I published my last comprehensive tour of my whole off-grid system. And I wanted to do a follow-up because a lot of people ask me, if I were to redesign this system tomorrow, how would I do it in a way that was more constrained by budget? I went pretty all in on this system. We'll talk a little bit about the system in this video, but what I wanna do is provide more further context and share with you some of my experiences and what I might change going forward, especially if I was constrained by budget. So if you haven't seen that first video where I do a full comprehensive tour of the system, click up in the top right and maybe watch that video first because it might give you, it will probably answer a lot of your questions that you're gonna have if you're just watching this. And it'll give you a bit further context on this, this whole system and kind of my situation. So if you're new here, my name is Curtis Stone, formerly known as the Urban Farmer. I'm now living off grid. And this channel is really all about being off grid and finding freedom and liberty on the land. That's what we're really all about here. And that's what I try to share with people. And sometimes that comes in many different shapes and sizes. Sometimes it comes into opinions and philosophical ideas regarding freedom, liberty, growing food, any of those things. Uh, or it comes down to just technical stuff like we're going to get into today. One caveat right out of the right out of the gate is I'm not an electrician. Okay, I hired electricians and people to build this system for me, but I had a, a, a general idea of how I wanted this system to look based on what my needs were. So kind of take that into consideration. We're in a cold climate, a zone five boreal climate. We're at a thousand meters of elevation. That's about three thousand feet. And our year in a nutshell looks like for 10 months of the year, we can be fully off grid with solar, no problems at all. But for the, the two months of the year, which we're into now, basically part of November and part of December, where we just get a lot of this, and I'm not really producing a ton of solar. And so sometimes I'll supplement my power with our diesel generator. But you can learn more about that in that video that I mentioned earlier. Now, in this video, we're going to look at a number of things. We're going to look at consumption, first of all, talk about system size, and we're going to talk about power sources, so solar, wind, micro hydro, generators, all those kinds of things. And then we're going to talk about batteries and storage. I'm going to leave out the details on inverters and charge controllers and all that because what I want to do in this video is create a framework of understanding where you can come up with um, the basis of a system that suits your needs based on your context. So one thing I also want to state right out of the gate is I prefer to discuss electrical things in terms of kilowatts and kilowatt hours. So some people like to use amps and, uh, and then refer to voltage. I just go straight to kilowatts and kilowatt hours. So kilowatts is the combination of amps multiplied by volts. And then kilowatt hours is that same multiple over time. So I'm going to refer to everything in this as kilowatts or kilowatt hours. And my system is all 48 volt. And if you're going to build a system that is sizable for a family, I would say just do a 48 volt system or more. Doing anything less than 48 volts just doesn't give you the amount of power that you need for running things like maybe power tools or, or things that might draw a little bit more power. So those are important to talk about right out of the gate. Okay, let's talk about consumption. Now, how much power are you consuming on average? That's gonna change if you wanna go off grid and you're gonna have to learn how to be uh, more conservative about your power use. But a really basic way to come up with, and we'll address this in this video in more detail as well regarding system size. But before you can design your system size, you wanna come up with what you use on average per day. Now, what you might say is, well, on this day I, I use about this much and this day I use about that much. And on Wednesdays, sometimes we do laundry and your week might vary a little bit. And that's okay. That's 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 what it is for most people. For example, you know, we only do laundry once or twice a week, and so we only need those kilowatt hours for that period of time. And that's okay. So total up all the the kilowatt uh, the kilowatts of everything that you run constantly. So 
If you run your blender every day, how much power does that draw for how long? If you have an HVAC system that has a constant uh, circulation system running, fans and whatnot, what's that drawing? If you have uh, water pumps, so for your domestic water that comes in from your well or a cistern or something like that and it puts it into pressure tanks, what does that take on average? Um, circulation pumps for the um, your boiler, things like this, your lights, all the stuff that's a constant draw, total those things up and then and maybe what you could do is create a seven week profile. So let's say you draw on average 10 kilowatt hours a day. And that's that's fairly conservative for a family. And we can get down to that low, actually. Um, but then you do laundry. Um, let's just say you do laundry twice a week and you're running a washer and dryer um, for a few hours. And so if you have an efficient dryer... Those the heat pump ones can get down to 1.5 kilowatts, uh, but the more standard uh, dryer would pull six kilowatts for a period of time. And so you know each load might be half an hour at six kilowatts. So that's three. So you might do you might do those three times. So then you've got an extra nine kilowatt hours to throw in two times a week. So basically, come up with an average. So you, let's say you've got uh, ten each day. And then you do laundry twice a week. That gives you an extra nine kilowatt hours for those two days. So come up with an average. And let's just say you, you come around. I'm not doing the math in my head. Uh, it's not that important specifically. But let's say you come up with an average on 15 to 20 kilowatts. That's a good start to build the foundation of a system is knowing what you need. You always want to buffer a little bit more for times that you might need elect uh, extra electricity, but we can talk about that in power sources. And one thing I'll add to that is there is a seasonal difference between your draw. For example, I draw, more, I use more electricity in the summer. And the main reason for that is I'm running irrigation up here. And that means that I'm pumping from my well and uh, year round that well will pump into the house uh, underground. But in the growing season, I'm pumping that water also up to a cistern that's 100 feet above me to give me head pressure. And so I'm running that well for at least a number of hours every day. And it's pulling about 1.5 kilowatts per hour. So I'm pulling, generally speaking, more electricity in the summer than I am the winter. That's okay. It's better to design your system based around your winter demands and what you expect to generate in winter. And we'll address more of that when we start to talk about, or this, this will become a little bit more clear, I should say, as we start to talk about other different sources and the, the size of the system. Let's talk about power sources, and we'll start with the elephant in the room here, my solar system. Most off-grid systems, call it 99% of off-grid systems, are going to have a primary and then a backup source. So my primary source on my system is solar. And it's 99.5% of the total kilowatt hours that I produce in a year. And my generator, which we'll, we'll talk about shortly, is a backup. And uh, solar is going to be the base for most off-grid systems just because, well, simply the sun shines or there's light most places in the world every day. So solar is the most reliable form of power. Up here, this time of year, it's very cloudy. And, uh, but for the rest of the year, it's, it's mostly pretty sunny up here. And this is the, the time of the year where I'm leveraging my generator the most. We'll talk about that more in this video. Uh, talk a bit more about the system, but just a bit more context here. Um, you know, three years with this system, my, um, for 10 months of the year, I'm overproducing with solar. And then for two months of the year, I'm underproducing. And, and on the shoulder season, I'm producing what I need, basically. But call it for six months of the year, I'm overproducing. For the other two on the shoulder season, I'm producing what I need. And then there's that period in the winter, two months, that um, I'm, I'm not generally producing enough. And I need to run a generator here and there. Um and so what that looks like as far as power is um, in the summertime, if I have a place to put the electricity, 
this system will produce for six months of the year over 100 kilowatt hours of power every single day, which presents a challenge um, in that if, you're, if you don't have a place to put that electricity, your panels will go into what's called a float state, is that once your batteries get topped and there's nowhere else for that power to go because you're not uh, needing it, they just turn off. And then you draw from your batteries a bit until, until it gets to an equilibrium where the solar will just allow what's needed to come in. And so that gets you into a whole other conversation, which I'll do another video about soon, about dump loads. Where can you dump extra electricity? Because if you're not using all your electricity, in a way, you are increasing the amortization or return on investment period of your system. And so that's important because, you know, I'll talk about how much all this costs me at the end and, and some things that I would do to reduce the cost. But uh, if you put all that money up front in your system, you're prepaying for your utilities. And so if you're not using all that power, you paid too much. And so it's important to, to be able to uh, put that electricity somewhere. So the system has three panel rigs. Each of these have 16 panels and the total... Uh, kilowatts of this is 20.8 kilowatts. These are all 400 and something watt panels. And so there's 48 panels. Uh, I've built a bit of optionality into the system that I could add another rig like this. And I just have to add a charge controller and then the wiring and the infrastructure. But my inverters have enough space to add another rig, another 16 panels, if I so uh, chose to. Though I don't really think I need to really at this point. Um, but these panels face slightly different orientations. So the, the one in the center is true south. This one here is 15 degrees to the east. And this one here is 15 degrees to the west. And some people don't understand why I did this. The reason I did this is so that I have extra available energy not coming from the batteries at different times of the day. And it was a bit of an experiment. And I would say if I were to change anything now... The only thing I would change is I would take my Western one and just orientate it straight to the South, but I would keep the Eastern panel the way it is. This one is really handy because if I've come through a long night, like we're getting right now in the winter, and I get some direct sun in the morning, the sun is now is, is setting further uh, in the South and it's coming up basically right here. And this house doesn't shade it actually, which is super cool. Um, but uh, it means that I get immediately... It'll be something like on a, on a sunny winter day, this panel will be producing 3,000 watts right away. And then the south one will be maybe 800 and then the western one will be about 200. And I like having that available energy because then I'm not drawing off the batteries. And so it's just, it was sort of an idea to reduce the cycling of the batteries. But some people who really understand how batteries work say that it's kind of pointless and, and, and maybe they're, they're correct. But either way, I would just redirect this one to the south because the south one does overall harvest more average energy. It's just that it doesn't, it, it, th this one gives me energy directly from solar and not at the batteries at a time that I need it, which is mostly the morning. The evening one is a little bit less useful in that regard, the, the western one, I should say. And so these panels don't track the sun. A lot of people say, oh, you got to have panels that track the sun and for the most part people who say that aren't off grid and aren't if anything they're off, they're they're off grid on a very hobby scale but to make panels track the sun go ahead and look into it crunch the numbers get some stuff ordered or at least in a cart and total it up and i i challenge people to do this because the numbers will not work out for you solar has become so cheap that it's just easier to add more solar PV panels than it is to have a, a, a rig track the sun. Trust me on this one. It's difficult logistically and engineering wise to have panels track the sun. The technology's there, it's been around for a long time. And with small, with small systems that might just have say one panel rig like this, it might be worth it to have that one panel track the sun. But you will find that you, it's... Anybody who's off grid at scale will tell you that it's just better to do more PV than add, uh, than add a rack that tracks the sun. These do adjust in their um, angle. And so right now they're in winter mode. There's a spring and fall mode and then there's a summer mode like this. And then there's a maintenance mode that, that leaves them flat. And I can move these around fairly easily myself. It takes me about 10 minutes 
to change the angle of these at each time of the season. Um, for the most part, I find the winter mode, if you were to have just one angle, if you had enough solar PV and you didn't want to have the move, you could just have it in winter in the winter angle. Though I find it is helpful to move these into spring and fall mode because that's the time of the year where I'm just getting enough. Uh, I'm not overproducing all the time. There's moments that you will. Um, but if I just had two modes, it would be this one and then spring and fall. And the summer mode is less valuable because there's so much sun and so many long days in the winter that, you know, you don't really need it as much. But, but of course, that depends on the details of your system. Um, the angle in the winter is very important for those of us in a cold climate or for those of us that are far from the equator. Because when I put it at this angle the winter sun is coming directly on here and I actually will generate more power on a sunny day in the winter at one time than I will in the summer. Uh, it's because the sun just moves so much more dynamically in the summer. It's, it's you know, for here, it sets or, or rises in the northeast and it sets in the uh, northwest. So the sun is all over the place. So the summer angle can really only do so much. Uh, but the days are long and you get more power than you need. Anyways, the winter angle is important for two reasons. One is to get that better angle at the sun. Two, it's to get the snow off. And this is where the, the whole conversation of why don't you just put panels on your roof comes up is that if you live in a place with snow, panels on the roof is just not practical. I mean, the devil's in the details. Of course, it depends on how much snow you get, how much daylight you get. But for me... My, my homestead and the home that we're building, which isn't finished yet, but we're, we're getting there, uh, is a passive solar home. So its windows are all on the south side. And that means that my roof, because of the way I've designed this, is sloping to the north. So to put panels on this roof, it doesn't make any sense. They'd have to be on a rack that was facing the south like this. And then what do I do when it snows? Climb up there and get it off and then shovel it away? It, the, the, it makes no sense. So having panels off the home in cold climates with snow is really the best way to go. And also, solar panels do emit a little bit of EMF. And so if, if, if that EMF is on your roof, and that roof is kind of close to say your sleeping area, or, or the area you spend a lot of time in, which, you know, wouldn't be your bedroom during the day. Um, but you want to consider that, you know, that's, that's some food for thought there, they do give off a little bit of EMF. So you got to be careful with that. It's another reason that I like to have them off the house. And so Oh, my neighbor's dog just showed up. <laughs> um, so anyways, that's some food for thought there with, with, uh, with solar panels. All right, let's talk about micro hydro. Now, I don't have micro hydro on the homestead here because I don't have a... I'm not near a source of water that's just constantly flowing. And that's what you would need in order to have micro hydro. I'm standing next to my pond here and I just wanted to address something right out of the gate. People often say... Why don't you just pump water uphill into a pond or a cistern like that or something like that and then draw it down and collect energy off it? Well, if you crunch the numbers on that, what you'll find is that uh, you put about twice as much electricity in to get uh, half as much back. So right there, it's not really worth it. Uh, and two, if you live in a place that has winter and things freeze, as they do here right behind me, you can see my pond is frozen over. Um, there's just, it's just not practical. It's just, there's, there's no real way to do it. Uh, especially, um, why would I want to lose this water uh, just to get a few kilowatts of electricity? It's, it's not worth it. But in regards to micro hydro, it is one of the best small scale energy systems out there if you're close to a source of water that has a constant flow that's enough to give you at least a couple kilowatts and that it runs year round. If you don't have that, microhydro is just not feasible for most of you. If you live in a temperate climate and you're near a spring or you're near uh, some kind of source of water that's constantly flowing, it's fantastic because you don't need very much infrastructure and it'll mean that if that, I mean, if that, if that runs year round 24 seven, you barely need to have batteries though. Batteries will be helpful for times that you need more when you need more electricity than what your system's putting out. So if you have a 
micro hydro system that let's say can deliver you five kilowatts constantly, which is which would be a pretty decent one uh, if you did. What if you need, what if you have something that draws six kilowatts or seven or eight? Then you need to have more. So that's where you might want to have a battery bank that you can draw from so that, that when the times, uh, when you need more power, it's available there for you. And that's a really important part of having a system is that uh, you can't just be limited by the size of your system, um, you, the total size of your system, um, if it is too small. Uh, that's why I have 20 kilowatts. I'll never pull 20 kilowatts of electricity at once. It would be highly unlikely. But that's why I have a 20 kilowatt solar array. And we'll talk about batteries later on, but I have 100 kilowatt hours of battery storage. So I can pull, I think, up to 14 kilowatts at once from my system. And so if you had a small micro hydro system, you would be limited by that unless you had batteries. So that's an important thing to point out. But going back to micro hydro, you got a number of things to factor in if you're going to look at a micro hydro system. The first one is, uh, do you have a source that runs year round or at least runs over half the year? Otherwise, it might not be worth, the set, worth it to set it up because if that water is only running in, say, the warmer months and not the winter months, if you have solar, you don't really need uh, extra electricity in the summer. You need it in the winter. So that would be the first thing is you need to have a source that's call it year round that's constant. Um, it has to be enough flow. So this is number two. There has to be enough flow in there to give you at least, you know, a kilowatt, two kilowatts at a time. Otherwise, it's it's kind of you're splitting hairs with how worth it it is to go put the infrastructure in. And then number three, how close is that source to where you need it? Because if it's, you know, hundreds or a thousand feet away running in ground wire that far becomes expensive. So you really have to look at the return on investment when you're factoring these things, uh, if, if it's worth it at all to do or not. But, you know, going to micro hydro again, in summary, it's a great thing if you've got all those factors and I don't have a system, so I can't really share with you any of the details of them, but you can go online and look at many examples of people doing small scale micro hydro. Again, it's a fantastic system if you've got those three things. If you don't, you're gonna be reliant on some of the other power sources that we're looking at in this video. All right, next we're gonna talk about wind. And I would say for the most part, wind blows. <laughs> and uh, one reason I can sh demonstrate that to you right now is I have some wind power up here. These are two 400 watt um, turbines they were actually they came with this property i didn't i didn't put these in myself um, but uh, the problem with wind is that if you don't have constant wind or if you don't have wind very often to put in all the infrastructure for it is not really all that worth it and what you can see right now is the sky behind me is very cloudy i think i've got about one kilowatt of solar coming in right now so it's okay i'm producing more than i'm consuming at the moment even with these clouds but during the cloudy and dark periods of the year is the time that something like wind would be very handy for me but that's not when it's windy here the times that it it gets windy here is in the spring mostly um, when it's really warming up and we're getting a lot of thermal dynamic changes throughout the day where it um it's uh when it cools when you had a warm day and then it cools down at night the wind the pressure changes and you get wind and we generally don't get a lot of wind we have it's breezy up here but it's not breezy enough to keep these moving especially during the times that i need them like right now if i had some wind coming in right now it'd be fantastic because it'd be supplementing my solar and it would be great and so there are some instances where people might benefit from wind power. But I would say overall, if you're in a place that's really windy, you probably don't want to live there anyways because being in places that it's windy all the time kind of sucks. You know, I've, I've traveled through most uh, states in the US and most provinces in Canada, and I can tell you the places that I've been that are always windy, say certain parts of Southern Alberta, um, many parts of Wyoming and Montana, they're windy all the time. And actually, even there's parts of um, down in the southeast that, that, are, that are windy all the time or parts of Texas even. It sucks being in a place that's always windy. It's just not enjoyable. It's harder to garden. Plants don't like it. Trees don't like it. So I'd say overall, 
wind power sucks. It's not really worth the effort. Um, again, there are some instances, but what you have to look at is, and, and you can measure all these things before you commit, is come up with a measurement. You can buy small weather stations. I have one on the property here. I can measure how much wind I get on average. It's not hard to do. You can even look at the uh, climate data that your government provides on, on you know, whether the uh, weather data for the US or Canada, you can find all that information. And if you're not getting constant wind or wind every day or wind enough to justify the expense, it's just not worth it. So I would say for the most part, don't even consider wind as a viable option for a solar system. Again, if you got lots of wind, Sure, but you might not want to live in a really windy place anyways. Okay, next let's talk about generators. This is my generator. This is a Yanmar. It's a 13 kilowatt generator. And um, it's diesel. And we'll talk about fuel sources here a little bit. Uh, but the reason I chose diesel is that I also run quite a bit of diesel equipment. And... I have an issue with getting large amounts of propane up here. And so propane would have been the other one that I could have gone with. But because I run diesel equipment and it's easy for me to store because I can go get it. I can take this tidy tank in the back of my truck and go fill this up. And I have two tidy tanks for diesel. I've got my this 600 liter or it's five, maybe 550 uh, liter tank which I use for filling up my machines, but I can also use it to fill this up. This is another 600 liter tank that is connected to the diesel generator. And that is about at full capacity. That's about six, liter, uh, six years of fuel for me. I really only burn about a hundred liters a year. And that's because I really only run this generator for so far. It's only been for, I, I think I've turned this on six times this month so far. And how it works is that this is connected to my whole system. And when my batteries go below 15%, the generator just kicks on and it starts just dumping uh, electricity into the batteries so that it can be used however I want. I can split where the power goes. I can tell the system that I want to have, say, uh, I find it's, about, it's most efficient to run this at about 80%. So that's at about 10 kilowatts. I can dedicate five to the load and five to the batteries. And so if I have a big load that pulls more then five, then it'll, it'll flip this thing off and then it'll just pull from the batteries. And so sometimes I'll have to tweak that. Let's say when we're in the dead of winter and I'm, and my wife needs to run the laundry. Um, and there's not, I don't want to run the batteries cause there's not enough power there. I can run this. I could go with this thing. I've got a redundancy switch where I could run our whole system just off the generator if I wanted to, but I could just go into my system and just tweak the, um, the battery balance and I could just say give 80% to the load and give the other 20% to the uh, to the battery so I can do that but the most common generators you'll see are gas power generators a small scale gas power generators you can buy anywhere and uh, those can work for small systems that you're getting started the one problem with gasoline is it doesn't store that well or doesn't store that well for long you can buy premium boat gas, which will last the longest, and you can add stabilizer to it. So you can you can make that fuel stretch out if you want to. Uh, but diesel generally just stores better for longer with even without stabilizer. I've been able to store diesel for over a year and it runs just fine. Now, I'm not saying that you should do that and that's necessarily best practices, but, but I, I can do that. Whereas if you store gasoline without stabilizer for a year, you won't get the same results and it'll be hard on your motor. So there's gas generators, there's diesel generators, and then there's propane generators. And I think you can make a fairly good case for a propane generator as well, especially if you're using propane for other things such as heating. Uh, and then you, maybe you have one of those big, large 2000 liter tanks and that that's going towards your furnace. And then it's also going towards your generator. I think if you had that uh, situation a, a propane generator you could make a really strong case for now i don't i don't have that i burn wood for heat primarily though once our house is finished we will uh be using a little bit more propane but uh, this is what we started with and I'm, and I'm quite happy with it and um i've got it built into this shack and it's soundproof because this thing is quite noisy it's actually just as noisy as my skid steer is when it's running 
but I'm really happy with this system. And um, basically what you want to spec with a generator, in my opinion, is you want it to be at least about half of what your solar output is. So if your solar, in my case, is 20 kilowatts, uh, I want to have a 10 or more uh, generator. A 20, a 20 kilowatt generator would be way overkill for me based on just, I really only get cloudiness for a month and a half or two months of the year. When I used to live in Kelowna, Kelowna gets cloudy for four or five months of the year on the winter. And so maybe a larger uh, generator could be justified in that case. But I find for, for my context here, uh, this 13 kilowatt generator, and I run it at 10 at about 80%, is it's just optimal for fuel efficiency uh, is perfect and basically it meets all of my needs um i really only need to run it for short periods of time so on days where we have prolonged periods of cloud and i'm i'm not getting enough solar each day to meet our daily loads and i'm basically just diminishing my batteries each day when this comes on if i run it for four to six hours that's enough to get my batteries topped up. So basically this will produce um, 10 kilowatts. And so my batteries won't really go below 15 or 20% before I need to um, uh, charge them from this. And I'll run this until my batteries get to 75%. I'll never charge my batteries past 75%. The reason for that is that if you get a little break of sunshine and you get a ton of power coming in, if you don't have a place to put that power in the wintertime, it really sucks because you've just now burned fuel when you didn't have to. And so I don't, I never charge my batteries past 75% with the generator. And I'll really only charge it to 75% if I can look at the forecast and see that it's going to be cloudy for a period of time, which is the case that we're in right now. Yesterday, I ran the generator for about four hours, got my batteries to 75%. And that that that'll last me quite a while but um that's kind of how i use the these this generator with my system and so again what you choose you know for for what you choose is up to you as far as gas propane or diesel i would say diesel and propane are the main ones for medium to larger systems and and tiny systems will use gasoline because you can just get these cheap commonly used uh, gas generators you can store some boat gas for a system like that they're fine uh, but for any for any system that's you know a 10 kilowatt or beyond system you, you're going to use diesel or propane and 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 you could really debate which one is best but it just comes down to your context all right we are in my garage at the heart of the system and I've described all of these things in detail in that last video that I mentioned that I shot last year. So if you have more questions about that, maybe just go watch those, that video and, and, and a lot of the stuff uh, will make more sense to you. But this is the, in, these are the charge controllers here. So one, two, three, each of these is connected to one of the solar panel rigs outside. And then that comes in as direct current. And then it goes to these inverters and it inverts that electricity and then it either goes to the load or goes to the batteries. And so that gives us our AC power. And then we got the batteries here, which uh, that's 100. It's 96 kilowatt hours to be exact, but I just say 100 just to keep things simple when I'm talking about the mathematics of it all. Um, your system size will be based on the primary power source that you have. So my primary power source is solar, as we've seen. And that literally is 99.5% of the electricity that's produced in my system comes from solar. And that 0.5% comes from the generator. So the generator is my secondary source or my backup source. You need to always have a primary and a backup. Uh, there are some places you can get away with just having solar, probably in the tropics or a place that just has enough consistent sunlight that you never need a generator. But kind of always want to have a generator just because there might be times for redundancy. Maybe there's something wrong with the solar or, or, or whatnot. Uh, maybe you don't have enough battery storage. So here I want to just talk a little bit about the system size and then next we'll talk about battery storage. So at the beginning of the video, I talked about consumption. I talked about how the, the way you want to frame the system is based on what your needs are. So if you consume 
on average, say 10 kilowatts, uh, 10 kilowatt hours of electricity in a day. And that could be an average. That's a seven day average that you've, that you've boiled down. You can make your system half to f that full amount or, or, or even beyond if you like, but it's a good, it's a good way to start. So if you're consuming uh, 10 kilowatts a day on average, 10 kilowatt hours a day on average, you could start with a five kilowatt solar system and then your batteries will be uh, one and a half times what you need. So if you're consuming on average 10 kilowatt hours a day and you want to start smaller with solar, you could do that and then you just burn more fuel for the times that you need it, uh, thus paying less up front. So I didn't do it that way. I did it where I went as much as I could up front. I'll talk about the price uh, in, in a little bit here. I spent more up front so I have to burn less diesel in the short term. And the reason I did that is because I'm a prepper and a bit hardcore. So my, my context is I might not always have diesel available. Uh, fortunately, I've got a lot in storage and fortunately we can still buy fuel. So we're good. But you could start with a, a, a five kilowatt system solar and then you'd want to have one and a half times your daily use. So if you if you consumed 10 kilowatt hours a day, you would want to have at least one and a half times for battery storage. So that would leave you with, um, say, at least 15 kilowatt hours of battery. I would say probably you want a little bit more, maybe up to 30 kilowatts, but you use that as a, a basis for it. So in my case, I wanted to go larger on batteries, but I could have gone less and just, as I said, burned more fuel in the short term. Now, fortunately, fuel is still relatively cheap. Diesel, you know, even at today's price of $1.80 per liter in Canada, uh, that works out to be something seven, six bucks a gallon. I, I don't know what the exact conversion is in the U.S., but, you know, we're paying the most we've ever paid for diesel. And it's still relatively affordable because, like I said, I only burn about 100 liters of diesel a year. That's only $180 in today's dollars in Canada. So it's, it's not really that bad. But basically, your system size should be somewhere between half to the full amount that you need to start as your solar. So let's say your 10 kilowatt hours a day. Go with 5 to 10 kilowatts of solar to start. And then 1.5 times that for your battery storage. That's a framework and that's a cheaper way to do it than what I did was I just went way more hardcore on batteries. And I did that because I found that if I didn't care about having things CSA approved, uh, when you're off grid, you know, you do everything towards, uh, do, do everything to spec in the way it's supposed to be. But do I care about a stamp that says CSA approved? Uh, I saved a ton on my batteries by buying batteries from the U.S., <laughs> that weren't CSA approved, but they're for all intents and purposes, just fine. They work just fine. But I saved me about, um, well, it saved me about $60,000 in batteries to get the same kilowatt hours that I wanted. So to get a hundred kilowatt hours of battery storage in Canada would have cost me about $90,000. Uh, but to get them from the U S cost me a third of that. So it's quite significant. But what I did was I just went, hardcore on batteries because we get these really cloudy periods of time and I wanted to carry, uh, have a lot of battery storage that I could go many days. So I, I always say minimum one and a half days. I can go about four to five days of power with my batteries. Uh, and, and that was just the choice I made. I didn't have to do it that way though. And this is what I'm saying is you could make your system a lot cheaper if you just burn more fuel that's really what it comes down to, is that my entire system, I could have shaved half the price off if I just wanted to burn more fuel. But I, did, I chose not to do that and that was my choice, but I'm saying if you wanna save money up front, that you could do that. So let's just talk a little bit more about batteries and we'll kind of wrap this up, kind of talk about the total cost of all the systems. So these are LiPo batteries. They are a lithium iron phosphate batteries battery and um, this is technically 96 kilowatt hours 
and there's three rows of six. So each of these batteries is fifty one five point one kilowatts each, basically kil kil uh, kilowatt hours each, or fifty one twenty watt hours. So five point one two times eighteen. And that, that's the total amount of battery capacity on my system. And um, I really like these batteries. They have been fantastic. Um, anytime I've had an issue with anything, it hasn't really been the batteries. It might have just been uh, something with my controls. But it's all been, uh, I've, I've been able to work out all the kinks with these. And I pretty much don't have to think about them at all. They just, they run anytime my generator comes on. It all just works. And uh, yeah, they were a lot cheaper to get these batteries than some of the other alternatives out there. Um, and so, you know, people ask me how I like this system. I think they're great. Uh, I wouldn't change anything with them. You know, maybe I could buy more batteries in the future if I wanted to. At the same time, it's not that difficult to store fuel. And uh, diesel can store for a long time, especially if you stabilize it. Sure, propane stores longer, but my context is that propane is harder for me to transport up here because the big propane truck to come and fill up a big tank doesn't want to come up here. So I have to have stuff that's more mobile, and diesel for me is more mobile. That's what that's the primary reason I've gone with diesel as my main my main fuel source. So this whole system cost $130,000 Canadian. So that's about a hundred grand US. And um, would it cost that same amount today? I can't really say that. I'm not exactly sure. Pro it probably would new. It probably costs a little bit more now just because of inflation. And I've had this for three years. Um, and so that price includes everything you see, all the wiring, all the labor, everything all in. Everything all in my whole system costs one hundred thirty thousand dollars. So again, if I wanted to make it cheaper, I could have gone with half the amount of solar. I could have gone with a third or two thirds less the batteries. I could have one less inverter and probably one less charge controller. And I could have had this system for half the price, and I'd just be burning more diesel up front. And so that's really what it comes down to is you can have this exact system for cheaper, just burn more fuel in the short term, and that is going to be cheaper in the short term. My context was, well, what if I can't get diesel? And so again, we can go and debate these things and philosophize about how the world's going to be and what's going to happen until we're blue in the face, but it really just comes down to the decision for you and what makes the most sense for you. So that's kind of this whole system in a nutshell. Those are my thoughts on the fundamental things that you could do to save money. I hope this video has been valuable to you. Let me know what your contacts is. Let me know if you have an off-grid system, what you're, uh, what you're using, what your main power source is. Curious if there's any people out there who are actually off-grid who use wind. I know uh, most people that comment about wind aren't actually off-grid um, because if you talk to people that are off-grid, very few actually use wind. I have met very little in my life, but I'm curious. I could be wrong and I could just be not seeing something. So let me know in the comments. And um, yeah, I just want to remind you guys real quick. We have our biggest offer of the year. The Freedom Farmers Black Friday Cyber Monday offer it goes till the end of this week. It is a one-time payment for all the resources in our platform. So 20 plus courses, our whole social media suite, groups, live events, uh, our Homestead Accelerator program, everything in there. Also, all the From the Field TV content is all included in that. It's all bundled. So, if you're interested in joining the Freedom Farmers platform and all the great products and services that we offer in there, check it out. There'll be a, a link in the video here in the show notes. And uh, I'll see you guys in the next one.